Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Martin Donahoe, MD, uh, who is on the uh, adjunct f uh, faculty at Portland State University. Martin practice, practices internal medicine and serves on the board of advisors of Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility. He lectures nationally and teaches courses in medical humanities, public health, social justice ethics, and women's studies. He is author of Public Health and Social Justice, and his slideshow and writings can be found on his website at www.phsj.org. So, welcome to the Populist Dialogues. Thank you, David. It's really nice to be back after a few years. It, it has been a few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is good to have you back. So, you want to title uh, this program, uh, Science in the New Dark Age. Um, talk about the new dark age. Well, it's depressing time. Science has been through many dark ages, as you know, the Middle Ages, uh, where the Salem witch hunts, the co-optation of physicians during slavery to diagnose slaves with diseases like drapetomania, which was the tendency to run away. Mm -hmm. uh, the eugenics <laughs> movement, and go figure, the eugenics <laughs> movement at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but today we're entering an era which has potentially very significant consequences for science and the next generation of Americans, science for the world, and the reputation of the United States vis-a-vis -vis science internationally. Okay, yeah, and so, so talk then about science itself. Well, I, I love science and consider myself a scientist, and science is the process of discovery, of finding out something about the world, about ourselves, about the environment that we as a species didn't know before. And it requires open investigation, it requires clearing your brain of any preconceived notions of what might or might not be true and allowing yourself to be open to the data. And the nice thing about science too is that it's self-correcting. Mm -hmm. So when one group of scientists runs a study and discovers something that another group tries to replicate and is unable to, then science moves in that direction. But practicing science and teaching science requires an agreed upon set of facts. When those facts go out the window, it's very difficult both to practice science and to teach a new generation of students to be excited about science mm -hmm. and to want to do science. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and with Trump, the, the science is going out the window. Unfortunately, yes, and it, it, this began actually before Trump. Um, the infiltration of curricula with things like so-called creation science, um, the obfuscation and the deliberate manipulation about uh, data related to, say, women and contraception as, how, as to how sex ed is taught in our high school, um, the disinformation that spread in places like uh, crisis pregnancy centers where they tell women that having an abortion will make them infertile or develop breast cancer. But under Trump, this has ramped up exponentially. Okay, yeah, and, and in, in our history, science has been repressed and manipulated in the past. So this is not the first time. No. Talk about a little bit about the past history of that. Right. Well, um, we could go back even to before the Middle Ages, but let's look at Galileo. Galileo was put on trial for basically acknowledging the Copernican view of the solar system, which was there, we're not at the center of everything. The sun That's is. That's hard to believe. I'm <laughs> sure that I am at the center of everything. <laughs> well, we all do in some <laughs> sense. Um, but that was really, that, that discovery changed humanity. All of a sudden, we weren't quite as important as we thought. Um, but that was very threatening to the status quo and to institutions like the church. Mm -hmm. And whenever scientists come up with new discoveries that's threatening to the status quo, in this case threatening, say, to the oil and gas industry with climate change, there's a concerted effort by those organizations, which are often very well funded, to subjugate the science, mm -hmm. to attack scientists' reputations that have anything to say against them. 
and it leads to a lot of confusion among the general public. Y y y y yes, yeah, there, there, is, there is confusion, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. How has Trump done this so far? What, what kind of specific actions has he taken? Well, keep in mind that in addition to being a xenophobic, racist, acknowledged sex offender, uh, a textbook narcissistic sociopath, thrice married sybarite who acknowledges <laughs> that he does not like to read anything but his own book and has the attention span of a goldfish. Um, <laughs> this is someone who has called climate change a hoax, one that's been perpetrated by the Chinese, who's spoken out against vaccination. And when you scare parents and think that their children might get autism from a vaccination and you get maybe the one or two so-called scientists who are willing to state that and a news media that implies that there still exists some controversy and that message is being driven by the commander in chief and the leader of our country, many parents will shy away from vaccinating their kids, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, right, yeah. Um, uh, so corporations and powerful attempt to influence science as, as we understand it. Right, and in a few ways. One, of course, is lobbying. There's 40,000 lobbyists in D.C., 12,000 of them are full-time, mm -hmm. and um, they do this through PR. They do this through sponsoring and handing out free of charge uh, curricula for courses that are strapped uh, budget-wise or may not have someone who can teach, say, environmental health. And so one of my favorites is from Exxon. It's called the Energy Cube, and it's designed to mm -hmm. teach science to seventh and eighth graders. And it has quotes in it like, um, offshore drilling creates reefs for fish communities to thrive. <laughs> <laughs> or oil is simply solar power hidden in decayed matter. And both of those statements are true, uh, yes. but there's a long backstory that goes uh -huh. with that. And when we allow corporations to, to set the curricula in our schools, and of course schools may not have someone who's qualified to teach environmental education, you're going to have a whole generation of un under and miseducated children. Mm -hmm. And that's why our schools are so uh, rated so poorly when compared to other schools in, in other Western democracies. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and why schools in Oregon are rated so much lower than mm -hmm. they are in, in other, other states. Right, and graduation rates nationwide are at 65 to 70 percent, which really hasn't changed over the last 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so many of these problems that I remember encountering when I was growing up and thinking, well, uh, the, the story is that America keeps getting better and better, so these problems, you know, I may have to experience them, but those children who follow me won't. No, because it that requires constant vigilance. It requires vigilance by parents and by journalists. If I might, I'll give you just one example of how the media can play a role in confusing the general public. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there was a wonderful study in one of the premier scientific journals that looked at all the peer-reviewed studies relating to climate change over a 10-year period, and this was published about a decade ago. And all of them uniformly stated that climate change exists and that it is caused by human beings and the use of fossil fuels. Then, during the same period, they looked at all the articles on climate change in the four major newspapers, LA Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and um, Washington Post. Mm -hmm. They found that 50% of those presented both arguments, that it may or may not exist. They'd, they'd quote a co-opted scientist who was paid by industry. Um, and half of those that even acknowledged that climate change exists and that the planet is getting hotter, um, said that, well, it may be caused by things other than fossil fuel. And certainly there are other contributors, um, methane from cows and so on, but that by and large, this is due to our addiction to fossil fuel. Now, most people don't read nature and science. Mm -hmm. They read, if they do at all, newspapers. And when they receive that message and they go, well, I guess the scientists haven't figured it out, mm -hmm. so maybe it's not as serious as, mm -hmm. as yeah. they're presenting it. Hence the confusion. Right, and hence the delay in developing public policies mm -hmm. that can mm -hmm. change things. Yeah. Do you think, this is, a, this is a question you're not expecting, do you think that scientists should have uh, some um, 
uh, exalted position in terms of influencing policy? Well, I think I think to some extent, yes. I don't want to say exalted because unfortunately, yeah, I'm not sure that's not the right word. But, yeah, yeah. But. Many scientists today are um, working for industry, and it's unfortunate because even at grad schools, um, pharmaceutical companies and others have provided a large amount of funding to those in, to, to major institutions. And so, if you're getting a PhD and your research is partly funded by a pharmaceutical company, there may be a gag order on what you're allowed to publish, which of course can impede your career development. Um, when you go to work for one of those companies, it's not the scientists who have the final say over whether or not you make that data freely available to the public. It's the business folks running the operation whose sole purpose is to make money for their shareholders. Mm -hmm. And this is antithetical to the principle of science that requires absolute openness and sharing of data. So I believe that scientists should, should have a position in society where we are responsible for speaking out about our findings, for getting teachers uh, to work with us and helping teachers teach at everything from the elementary to the high school level for being more involved with the media and presenting our message in a way that's easier to understand and calling the media on their errors for engaging with politicians but I don't think we should be doing that ourselves we need to do that with the citizens who are affected by the results of our science mm -hmm. okay all right so if, if you have a scientist in the employ of some of these corporations uh, and they make essentially false or misleading mm -hmm. uh, statements, is there any way for the public to know that? Not necessarily, no. Uh, only through the self-correcting nature of science if somebody else um, does a similar study to show that that's false, but then the original scientist could claim, well, this is what we found in our data. Um, much data is withheld, for instance, from the FDA. Often it requires a whistleblower, and often it requires a scientist with conscience. And so one thing that I think should be required for all professional scientists is a course in scientific ethics. Mm -hmm. And we need to be very selective about those students that we choose to go on to graduate degrees in science. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and certainly uh, talking about ethics, that is something that should be studied in many, many fields. And unfortunately, the study of ethics is another area of study that has been diminishing rather than increasing. Right, right. right. Yeah, and, and, and we can certainly see that, you know, in terms of our political leaders, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Not, not only have they not opened an ethics book, they haven't opened the Constitution either. <laughs> well, you think about it. If Trump was running for the local school board um, with his policies uh, and being an admitted sex offender and, and his views on uh, various types of science. I imagine that many of those who voted for him to be president would say, wait, we, we don't want this guy on our local school board. Mm -hmm. This makes us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that in and of itself baffles me a little bit as to how he was elected. I understand. Yes. I understand. Right. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, actually, you're thinking about that. This uh, new uh, school board superintendent for Portland Public Schools mm -hmm. that, that the uh, board was looking at is now uh, decided not to, uh, or ha has withdrawn his, so his application. Heard. And there's some things in the Oregonian this morning. Some, some of uh, they they won't release the report, uh, but that was some of the stuff that was that was included in the in the speculation that uh, why that might be happening. And even if he wasn't withdrawing, why we we would we would ask him to withdraw. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and that is kind of one of the good things about local politics is you do have a chance of, of diving into some of these kind of questions right. about people. And, and you have to keep their hands to the fire. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unfortunate in this country that much of education has been privatized. And uh, I, I think that that movement, which of course was uh, participated in by Trump with Trump University, uh, and uh, of whom our current education secretary is a proponent, mm -hmm. is an unfortunate move. 
Uh, but it's a question of values. Why is it that we fund education so poorly? Why is it that teachers are not better paid? And why is it that the current administration is trying to defund so many agencies involved in science and yet wanting a multi-billion dollar increase in military funding when our military already is funded as well as the next nine combined? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, what's happened to us as a society, and, and is this sustainable? Uh, yeah. And, and unfortunately, those larger questions that you just asked are not the questions that Americans generally ask. Right. And of course, we don't get answers for it right. as, as a result. And I understand that I have a bit of a luxury being a physician um, and having a, a better socioeconomic profile than most people to have the time and the energy to a ask those questions. Um, many people, of course, are trying to put food on the table, working as single parents, um, trying to pay for health insurance, which is something that they should never even have to worry about mm -hmm. um, in, in this country or any civilized nation. Yeah. So off, off our topic. But, Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, you're not off. I'm going to go off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But talking, talking about health care, uh, Representative Blumenauer is going to be doing a, uh, a town hall. Uh, well, it may actually be after this broadcast, but mm -hmm. uh, on uh, finally advocating for a single-payer health care system. Mm -hmm. you know, so a, a few words about single-payer? Well, single-payer is something that all other industrialized nations of the world have, and it is a system whereby the government pays for health care. It does not run health care. We already have single-payer in a sense that more than half of our country is covered by Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Native American Health Service, TRICARE for the military, the VA and so on. Um, but under a single payer system, the profit motive is taken out of things. So administrative overhead in the United States is, is huge now. It's a quarter of all health care costs. And instead of having those costs being diverted away from patient care, a single payer system like Medicare or Medicaid, which has an overhead of two to three percent, would mean that ultimately we would all save money except for those in the wealthiest echelons of society who would pay more in taxes. Mm -hmm. And so while some of us in the middle class might pay less in taxes, um, we would more than make up for that by the fact that we wouldn't be paying as high insurance premiums. Um, we wouldn't have the worry of bankruptcy, and, and medical costs are the number one cause of bankruptcy in mm -hmm. this country. And we would live in a society where we acknowledge that anyone can get sick at any time, that life is completely random, and that we have a shared commitment to each other to recognize that trying to stay healthy and to make people healthy once again is an obligation of any civilized society that hopes to exist for long into the future. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. I, I can't stress strongly enough, too, as a physician, how that would untie the hands of so many doctors um, who would be allowed to simply practice medicine and not have to deal with the business and administrative side of things. Yeah, and I just ran into it because I'm, I'm on, on, on Medicare, but my medical records show that uh, I also have MOTA through my partner, uh -huh. and my medical records somehow got switched so that they're billing me uh, MOTA first oh. instead of Medicare, which screwed everything up. And now I have to pay the bills f for a, a small, a short period of time. Right. But, uh, luckily, I have the resources to do this, but well, I have to pay the bills and then get Medicare to reimburse me. <laughs> so it What's was interesting, <laughs> a colleague of mine who's involved in single payer uh, about a decade ago went to two hospitals of similar size, Mass General in Boston and Toronto General in Canada where they have single payer. Mm -hmm. At Mass General, the billing department took up an entire floor of the hospital and had hundreds of employees. At Toronto General, he had a hard time finding the billing department. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was located in a basement cubicle and had two part-time employees. Right, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And and that, that would be a nice situation for like. us to be in, right, right. yeah. And, and, and of course, the other, the other big benefit of single payer is that people will actually be healthy. Right. Healthier. Right. Uh, right, yeah, which is uh, not to be discounted. <laughs> As right. a benefit, so, right? Yeah. So uh, going back to the war on science, sure. Uh, what are the implications of Trump's war on science for healthcare? Well, for healthcare, for for democracy, for, for well, science itself. That's a great question. Um, it, it, it's going to be very hard, first of all, if we're miseducating our youth today. Um, 
to have them be competent scientists. So that's, that's one problem. The second is it's going to be hard to get college students to be excited about working, say, for the government, for an organization like the EPA or the Energy Department, realizing that, A, their findings might be gagged, um, and they may not be able to freely communicate those. B, they're going to be working for someone who fundamentally doesn't believe in science. Mm -hmm. um, so what they're going to do is, is either decide against a career in science or go work for industry because that's where the only other jobs are other than the few that are available in academia. And it, it essentially could mean an entire generation lost. And it will damage our reputation internationally among other countries who have looked to us as a beacon of sound science. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I, I think other nations have looked at looked to the United States as a beacon for many things. Right. And all of those beacons are, are becoming rather dim, right. at, at least in my humble estimation. <laughs> and, and science is really one of them. And and the whole the whole question. Of, well, we talked about healthcare. Right. Uh, you know, clearly uh, they haven't been looking at the United States as a beacon. For, for a very long time in healthcare, uh, uh, so it's a national embarrassment, frankly. Uh, y yes, y yes, uh, it is. He is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, yes. And, and, and I judge from your your uh, uh, your description of him, uh, the descriptive terms you use, that you don't have a high opinion. Do, do you have anything uh, that you would say positive about uh, Donald Trump? Oh boy. Um, I don't want to tax you. <laughs> I, I hear he makes a great chocolate cake. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I like chocolates. <laughs> right, okay. All right, well, okay, that's uh, probably not uh, in the realm of policy. <laughs> well, I think we need investment in infrastructure. Um, uh, which he has pledged to do, um, some of which, of course, is a border wall, which I'm opposed to. But rebuilding our nation's highways and bridges, of course, mm -hmm. should be a priority. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I, th I think he's, his proposals are public-private partnerships, which right. never work out very well for no. the public. They, they quite frequently work out quite well for the private parts Absolutely. of it. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, yeah. There was a article I read just a couple of days ago uh, from Ellen Brown, who uh, is a public banking advocate, uh, talking about how China has been able to develop so rapidly mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with such depth. Uh, they developed uh, 12,000 miles of rapid transit, uh, rail transit, um, a, a, in a period of um, like 15 years. Uh, and her, her answer was that they didn't go to Wall Street. <laughs> you know, all of these things we can do if we want. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of values and priorities and having legislators with backbones who will stand up and say, I'm not going to do what the lobbyists are asking me to do and those with money. I'm going to do what the people who elected me want done. Um, but of course, then you get into the question of why is it that so many people don't vote? Um, why is it that only half our country votes in most elections? And especially, why is the, it that those are the, the, mo the most disfranchised tend to vote less? Poor people, renters, mm -hmm. people of color. Um, so part of our job is to get people out to the polls and to get them energized about politics, to run for office, and to get to the point where they're mad as hell and they're not going to take it anymore. <laughs> yeah, but the other, the other part of it is we actually need to have candidates running for office that are offering different solutions Absolutely. Than, than what we have now, which is a large reason why Trump is in office, is because he seemed to be, answer, be uh, uh, asking different questions and answering them differently than they have than the power structure has asked. Right, and he of course was making promises that he knew he couldn't keep. Yes, but that were appealing to to many who um, who do want jobs and do want uh, health care and do want better schools and so on, but it's not something that he has shown throughout his career that he can deliver and during the embarrassing first hundred days. Uh, it's like watching a bad soap every, opera every day and I, I have to confess I'm compelled to, to log on uh, first thing in the morning just to make sure we're not at war uh, yes. or that, uh, that our banking system has uh, not collapsed. Just right. collapsed, exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Uh, so a few more minutes. Sure. What should citizens do with regard to science? How can they uh, affect how we regard science? First of all, read. 
Right. Second of all, um, talk to those that are teaching your children. If you're a scientist, go into the schools. Volunteer to come and speak for uh, an hour at your child's school. Talk to the school board. Um, look at the textbooks the children are using. Look at the curricula that they're using, especially for things like environmental health and sex ed, to make sure that they're scientifically accurate. Um, support independent journalism. And when you see journalists making mistakes, if you're a scientist or even a citizen scientist, call them on it. Uh, and then I would call also on scientists, as we said, to become more involved, for journalists to become more responsible, and to not, in their efforts to be, air quote, fair and balanced, which of course we want them to be, but to not present scientific data in a way such that one scientist who may be employed by industry has an opinion that carries the weight of 999 scientists, mm -hmm. because that'll just confuse the public. And ultimately vote. Vote for those who support science. And frankly, it's not just science alone. I advocate a comprehensive curriculum, curriculum where students will learn about great literature, great art, history, because you can't learn about science in the absence of knowing how we got here as a society, about what great writers have had to say about the human condition and how artists have portrayed that. So it all has to come together. And if you're in college, don't just major in engineering and take one or two courses that are easy uh, history courses. Challenge yourself. You won't have much of a chance to do that and spend time learning in your future. Yeah, right, right. Well, I, I, feel, I feel inspired right now. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you very much for being on the show. It's been a great show. pleasure. Yeah, okay, I, well, I admire the work that you do oh, so much. Thank you. Well, well, we will have you on again. Thank you. Right, good, good, yeah. So we've been talking with Martin Donahoe, uh, MD, and part of the adjunct faculty at the School of Community Health at Portland State University. Most of his thoughts and writings can be found on the Public Health and Social Justice uh, website at www.phsj.org. Thank you for watching the Populist Dialogues. I hope that we will see you again next week and that you will, ha that you will move toward a progressive populist tomorrow. Bye.